Hello, my name is William Hahn. Today I'd like to discuss some deep learning concepts and as they relate to bioengineering. Primarily, we're interested in reverse engineering the human visual cortex. How does the collection and assembly of neurons that you're using right now to understand this visual scene, how does that operate and what can we learn from those structures to build intelligent machinery? These ideas are very popular right now is an explosion in AI research, but these ideas have been around for a very long time. Here we can see from 1850, Alfred Smee and his diagram of a neural network. <clears throat> so here we can see skin, ear, and eye. The idea that was the signals from your eye are going to go into this neural network, get routed around this graph-like structure, and the output is then going to get relayed to the muscle groups. So we can see here it's upside down, but this says brain, nerves, and body. So here we have an example of this. Uh, shortly after World War II, these started to be constructed in hardware, and these were known as perceptrons. And the idea is now that we can simulate these in software. We no longer have to wire up uh, this enormous number of connections. We can simulate this with high, very high-speed digital electronics. This is what that Mark I perceptron actually looked like at Cornell University. Here they were losing it to look at uh, digits of a large font. We'll see in a second. And the image input was only 20 pixels by 20 pixels, so a very small <clears throat> input is what we'd imagine for an image today. So there you can see the capital letter C that they were trying to recognize, and this enormous machinery behind it for such an incredibly simple task, something out of Sesame Street, which was still outside the reach of science and engineering at the time. Things got um, really started with uh, uh, Arthur Samuel here, and he worked at IBM, and he really got the machine learning revolution started. One of his famous examples here was with his checkers playing program. And so this is a punch card computer. You can see the, the magnetic tape in the background, but this computer was, had punch tape storage. And what Arthur was able to do here is actually write a computer program that was able to beat him at checkers. Now think about that for a second. How do you write down this list of rules that will beat you at checkers? Right? The first approximation, that almost seems impossible, but that is really the power of a learning machine. In 1985, we jump ahead a little bit, this was the fastest computer in the world. This was the uh, Ames Research Center, the NASA's digital wind tunnel that was used to design the space shuttle. The point being is that now we can get this computer practically for free. So uh, another computer, that computer we were just looking at was the Cray in today's dollars adjusted for inflation. That would cost at least $16 million. Mind you, it would not connect to the internet or anything like that. <clears throat> it had 256 megabytes of RAM. Nowadays, you can get a Raspberry Pi for around $5. You can get a $40 Raspberry Pi computer that has 512 megabytes, twice as much, you know, for the, for the price of a, like maybe an actual Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is extraordinary and something we need to consider. So we're all familiar with cameras. Cameras take us from the world of physics to the world of images, right? Here, the original uh, camera obscura was just a, a hole in the wall where light would come in, and then uh, you could see it and paint on the other side, and then the artist used this for centuries. Uh, image processing, as you're well aware, many apps, you can take in a photograph and have it do something to the photograph. So the input is a photograph, and you get out a photograph. That's image processing. Computer graphics is where we have symbols, like uh, Python code or something like that, that creates images, video games, like here, Pac-Man. What we're going to be interested in, that, that's going from symbols to image. We're going to be interested in the opposite. What is computer vision? And that's sort of the, the branch of engineering where we want to go from an image to a symbol. That given this collection of pixels, I would like the symbol to tell me that is a cat. <clears throat> and so here we have now the internet is full of cats and dogs, that's what most people upload, and so this problem doesn't seem very difficult, but uh, as recent as 10 or 15 years ago, there wasn't a computer on the planet that could easily or accurately separate photographs of this type into these two different categories. This seems very strange to us. Uh, most of you have all been able to do this problem since you're about you know, 18 months old or so. Uh, this doesn't seem to be difficult, largely because most of your visual cortex, most of your brain is actually developed dedicated for this specific task, right? So it's that we have this dedicated hardware that it seems effortless to us, but it is anything but. So up here in the corner, we see uh, the original neural network from 1850, bringing in the eye, and now we see a sort of, uh, maybe a periodic table type representation of the different classes of neural networks that are, that are popular today. So we see very popular things like deep convolutional neural networks, we have long short-term short, long, uh, short -term memory systems, and as well as a whole bunch of other type things like residual networks and others that are becoming very, very popular. Why is this a difficult problem? Again, it's because of most of our brain is dedicated to analyzing data of this type, we take for granted uh, how difficult it is to process data of this sort. So here we have an example 
of some data that's representative of how challenging is this, these types of problems are for a machine, for a computer, for an algorithm. And so as you look at this data, try to think, what does the data come from? Is this um, a laser scan of a Grand Canyon? Is this an underwater sonar range off the, you know, the, the Gulf Stream, off the coast of Florida? Uh, it, it sort of looks like maybe you, you know, took a drone and flew it around and captured some data. Well, it, it's, it's none of those things. And you all know exactly what this is. This is an image. This is an ordinary image. This is an ordinary black and white image. This is the very first one that came up during the Google search for this term. You've all seen this image before. You just cannot recognize it. In just a second, this will turn into the right view. Your cortex will snap into place, and you'll say, oh, I know what that is. Now, that's been there the whole time. All of that data has been there the entire time. Now, when we ask ourselves, what does it mean to analyze visual data? What does it mean to, to, to look for a, a medical condition in, a, in, a, in an image? What does it mean to look for a face or to identify an emotion or, rec or recognize somebody? We can see this is an extraordinarily difficult task when we look at the data directly. So how does a deep neural network do it? Well, the way a neural network does it is sort of uh, breaks down the images into patches of commonly reoccurring features. And it uses a technique known as convolution to try to extract these features and find out where they are present in the image itself. This is very related to an area called sparse coding. And so I'd like to give a representation to kind of give you some uh, intuition about how this type of thing might work. So imagine you're watching something on, say, Netflix or YouTube. There's millions of pixels that have to be shipped over the Internet to get to your desktop. What we have here is imagine we take one frame and one little patch of a scene, and we want to communicate that, essentially Morse code, if you will, to the, to the recipient. One way to do that, if we have a 16 by 16 patch of pixels, one way to do that would be to communicate as packets the brightness, the grayscale value of every one of the 256 pixels. Naturally, this would require the transmission of 256 different numbers. But what we can do instead is we can download a special dictionary, a custom set, this learned basis, this pseudo overcomplete dictionary. And what these little shapes are is sort of uh, templates, sort of uh, pieces that show up over and over again. And now if we have this scene that we would like to represent, instead of specifying all of the pixels, we can just give a recipe. We can say it's 0.8 of number 36, 0.3 of number 42, and 0.5 of number 63. Now I've essentially set six numbers the magnitude and the identity of the patch. Now, six numbers is a lot less than 256. There's a tremendous savings. So you can imagine the savings occurring both in a biological organism and then also being very desirable in a digital computing system. What's very interesting is these types of patterns are actually representative of how neurons, real neurons work. And so in the area of electrophysiology, people go in with single unit electrode recordings and can actually measure the receptive fields of single uh, neurons in, your, in the real brain. And they, and they respond to similar, almost exactly the same features as we find when we train the machine learning systems. <clears throat> so here we have that little feature. We can think of it as an oriented edge. It's a sort of a black shadow with a white edge, and then it's sort of at a particular angle. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this convolution operator to sweep this feature around an image and create a feature map. And that map tells us where in the original image that feature can be found. And so here we see that for two different features. And so the way a convolutional neural network is going to repeat this process, in the first layer, we're going to have 96 convolutional filters, for example, in the popular architecture known as AlexNet. And then we're going to go through and apply this process over and over again repeatedly until we finally get down to a set of data that's simple enough that we can, uh, we can apply a traditional mathematical model, something like a linear model that will tell us that this is a dog or a cat or a bird. So this is exactly how the Tesla self-driving car works. Every image, there's a good number of cameras on the front of that car, and that's going to break in those images down into these different features. Here you can see each of the filters are essentially a specialist looking for some particular feature in that image. And then that gets reported up to the next layer where there's another set of specialists. Ultimately, in the case of the self-driving car, the final layer will tell should it turn left or should it turn right. Interestingly, these same size of patterns also show up in the audio cortex of, of uh, real animals. And so there's a strong reason to believe that there's a, a lot of correlation between what these algorithms are doing and how the human brain actually works. Ultimately, what we're interested in is building a full brain. How can we take in all of these signals, just like our brain can bring in all of these very different systems and, or and orchestrate them all together? How can we do that for the massive data sets that are created? Here we see in the 50s, if you wanted to move 5 megabytes, you needed an airplane and a forklift. By 2005, you had something the size of your fingernail. And then amazingly, just a short nine years later in 2014, that had gone by a factor of 1,000. And so here we have 128 megabytes going to 128 gigabytes, essentially for the, for the same price of $99. That's an incredible improvement. When you think about something 
uh, and bringing it down by a factor of 1,000, that means a brand new sports car costs the, the, the price of a tank of gas. So we see that this explosion, this is why uh, this field is, is so exciting right now, is because of all the different sensors and this, you know, even eventually molecular sensors that we're seeing. On the left, this is the gyroscope that got the astronauts to the moon and back. They cost millions of dollars, weighed 50 pounds. Every single one of you have one of these in your pocket right now. This is the accelerometer that helps your phone know if you flipped it sideways. This ability to capture this kind of data, to put these accelerometers on humans, on, on, on fish, on plants, on, on people, on anything you can possibly imagine, this is really the explosion uh, that's, that's so exciting. So there's been an information overload. In about 2007, we passed into a new regime where we now, even if you could afford all of the computer hard disks and media storage on the entire planet, there is still not enough to capture all of the information that is created. This is why a lot of the social media things sort of delete stuff after just a few minutes. Uh, hopefully people get to see it. The, the idea is that these, those companies are no longer willing to store all that data. They just simply do not have the storage. And so we're going to need machine learning and uh, real-time analysis triage techniques to help analyze that massive influx of data. You might have heard of something called Moore's Law. Gordon Moore worked at Intel in the 60s, and he made a linear plot of the number of transistors that were on each computer chip as a function of the year, the time. Uh, this was when extended by a couple of folks. Ray Kurzweil created this 100-year version, and you can see that this growth in information processing technology has nothing to do with transistors, and it has nothing to do with even with electricity. This is about information itself and how information technologies compound themselves, and you can basically use computers to make better computers. And so we can see here all the way here at the end, at the very beginning, we have the analytical engine, we have hand tabulation, and all the way at the top, we have some of the, the computers that we have in the FAU laboratories, the Titan X. These are capable of performing trillions of operations every single second. <clears throat> we need these types of calculations now to handle, if nothing else, just the images that come in from your camera. A typical cell phone might have 16 million uh, measurements that come in just from a single camera. So we can think of that as a consumer device, but really this is now uh, very applicable as a scientific instrument. What can we do with 16 million measurements? To give a demonstration of why this imaging problem is hard, from a different point of view, let's imagine that we wanted to collect images, uh, very pixelated images, but we wanted images of, of all possible images of this type. Let's imagine we have just an 8x8 pixel array, and the images are constrained to be either on or off, black or white. Pixels are either exist or they don't. And so we're going to have a yes or no choice. And so that will give us two raised to the 64th power number of combinations of images of that type. That's already an enormous number. And if we make it grayscale, now we have 256 different values that can be independently chosen for the brightness of each pixel if I want to represent every possible picture of this size. This already is going to vastly exceed the number of atoms in the universe. So even if we were somehow to print these images onto one single atom, there's not enough space in the entire universe to enumerate all of these images. So somehow, when we think of processing this type of data, we cannot just possibly have a large filing cabinet with all of the examples. If we go to a color image, for example, the situation gets much worse, and now we get numbers that are known as hyper-astronomical, because these numbers from uh, combinatorics just swamp anything from the natural sciences. Uh, these numbers have 10 million digits after, 10 million zeros after. So in practice, we have these cameras that now fly around the world. There's these uh, cameras that are gigapixel, and so these flying drone-type cameras that now 1.8 gigapixel. That's 770 gigabytes a second, right? Now imagine you go to the Apple Store and you buy a brand new computer with a multi-terabyte hard drive. You walk out of the door and one, two, three, it's full, right? So we're talking about a million terabytes a day. This is an extraordinary amount of data. In terms of bioengineering, we now have these microelectrode arrays. You might have heard of Elon Musk's new company, Neuralink, where they're uh, miniaturizing these electrodes and they're threading them directly into to brain tissue. And so there's going to be an extraordinary uh, amount of data that comes out of these, these systems that's going to have to be cataloged in the same way these images of cats and dogs are. So the real hope is that we can bring together all of these medical image data sets and start analyzing them in a meaningful way. I was recently speaking with a radiologist who had to do very extensive training, specialized training, to be able to interpret black lung. People who do work in the coal mines have a very unique condition, and most radiologists, even you know, respiratory radiologists, are not trained in this very particular uh, patterns. Now, this is a perfect example that's right for artificial intelligence. The AI can go through and study in, in tremendous detail the nuances of something like black lung and then be an expert module that would when work together with real human beings on a committee to make the decisions. So the idea of bringing in all this data and breaking it down just like a self-driving car and ultimately making the decision about what to do with this patient. 
So we have these medical images. We have some very nice uh, medical scanners right on the edge of FAU campus in the research park. Here we have from the patent the very first MRI uh, ever, ever conceived in the 40s. And then here we have uh, the first image ever produced taken in the 70s. And so this single slice took four hours. And you can imagine, even if you don't know much about medical imaging, that there's very little that you can uh, discern from that as a physician or as a bioengineer. Nowadays, when we look at the uh, three Tesla scanners that we have in the research park, we can get incredibly detailed and rich images. These are now ripe to analyze with our machine learning techniques to, to give us better understanding. So here we can map out all of the neurons and actually now bring this into a circle to see, can we learn more about the brain, which will help us develop better algorithms, which will then give us more insight into the brain. So here we can see in the middle somebody who with Alzheimer's disease, where those ventricles have just kind of uh, grown over time, what we want to do is have the computer vision be able to go and actually measure and, and quantify those and assign linkages like you see on the right with a sort of a network representation to see how well can each region of the brain communicate with all of the other regions to build what's known as a connectome, an actual fingerprint of how your brain is actually wired together. Then the idea is, again, we can take in new brains and, and healthy brains and then analyze them against this data set and, and give uh, better recommendations to the physicians. So we can do things like detect things, we can classify things, and we can even segment things like tumors and, and, and concussions and strokes. So I believe there's no reason why we're not all going getting head-to-toe scans right now. If you said to, the, to, your, to your general physician that you wanted to get a full-body MRI, they're, they're going to think that they're going to recommend that you not do that. And the reason why is because they, you can't afford or they can't afford the time to go through and look through every slice. The promise of artificial intelligence is that we could analyze this full stack of data very quickly in all of its details and get a full head-to-toe scan very often, something that's sort of not accessible now and will be very soon. So if we look at, uh, just to end here, this, this show back from the 60s Star Trek, this was supposed to be 300 years from now. And in that show, they had this uh, mobile telephone, right? Now, the first mobile phone call came out three years after the show went off the air. So we were off by a factor of 300 in our ability to predict when these future medical technologies will get here. On the other side of the show, the other doctor uh, had this thing that he could swirl around somebody and it would tell them all about their diagnosis. I think what we're seeing now is with the capability of a, of a 16 or 20 million pixels coming in from a single camera, combined with the power of deep learning, we're essentially approaching this type of technology of medical tricorders. So I'd like to thank you so much for your time and attention today and for all of the help and participation from all of those who helped put this course together. Thank you so much.